So I'm going to talk about uh, one design, which is mostly uh, one of the first designs, I would say, which is a quantitative uh, research designs or QR in ELT. And let's look at the contents for this brief presentation. Um, I'm going to start with some characteristic of uh, quantitative research. And after that, I will be talking about um, data collection methods, data gathering methods in QR, in quantitative research. And then I'm going to uh, provide uh, three examples, uh, typical examples, one a local one from one of, one of our former students, and, and a very brief activity at the end. So, um, Characteristics of quantitative research, based on my experience and, 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 and other authors, um, we know that uh, QR is more oriented to analytical approaches in comparison with the second talk given by uh, uh, Dr. Oscar Narvaez. Um, quality of research is more, let's say, holistic or is on the basis of holistic and um, let's say uh, approaches. So there are like two, two extremes, but they are not really opposed to each other. They do complement each other. And one more characteristic is that um, deductive basis is very interesting in, in this type of research. Meaning that first we collect, let's say, first theory, we do investigate about the theory of the phenomenon being researched, then we collect data as opposed to uh, the other approach, which is uh, first data, then theory. I uh, won't be talking about that, but it's just a comparison. And in quantitative research, we normally, we normally stay, formulate hypotheses. That's why it's called hypothesis testing research. Or sometimes we formulate a quantifiable research questions. And sometimes we, we state all these hypotheses and research questions in terms of differences between variables, between groups, in relationships between variables. Uh, that's a, a good example for it. Uh, we can say uh, uh, smoking and cancer, for example, there is a relationship between both variables or doing exercise and being healthy to variables uh, related. Also, as we hypothesize, we can do uh, some predictions are are stated as well. We deal with numerical data, uh, numbers and figures all the time. And two key concepts in quantitative research, or let's say descriptive research, quantitative descriptive research, two key terms are normally uh, emphasized like sample or sampling and population. It's like when taking a sample of your blood. When we go to the doctors, we go to the, the for an analysis, we don't need to test the whole, I mean, or some or human beings blood, totally. We just need a sample. The same, this analogy, the same applies to quantitative research. But of course, the sample should be, or let's say must be, for the sake of research in this, in this area, must be, um, representative, meaning that the population can be, uh, let's say, represented by a smaller sample. In terms of data collection or data gathering uh, instruments, normally we use questionnaires, close-ended questionnaires, surveys, structure observations. We use these uh, 
instruments that are really uh, prepared in advance with a, that can be, a, let's say, converted into numerical data. I'm not saying that qualitative research cannot be converted into numerical data, that's, that's another thing. And another characteristic of QR is that we use statistics. Statistics, uh, not everybody likes statistics, I know, but at least we, we may be, or the researcher in this area should be acquainted with statistics. And there are two kinds of statistics, descriptive, giving percentages, giving means or averages. And the other type is uh, inferential statistics, having the, the capacity to, to generalize, which is the same, which is the next characteristics uh, afterwards. We can generalize, generalize, generalize results. When we generalize results, means that we have used inferential statistics, right? And another characteristic is that QR is replicable. Replication is common in quantitative research. It's like following a recipe. For example, a study of vocabulary strategies in Japan can be, can be done, can be conducted here in Mexico following the same, the same, let's say, recipe, the same design, and then we will be able to compare results between two different contexts. And finally, the product of quantitative research as compared, not opposed, I would say, as compared with uh, qualitative research is theory. We generate theory. We hypothesize something based on theory, of course, and we confirm that, that hypothesis and we contribute to theory. Mm -hmm. That's why, coming back to this, first theory, then data. In other approaches, in other designs, it is first data, first we collect the data, and then we construct the theory. Okay, let's move on. The um, data gathering methods more specifically in quantitative research. As I said before, the most common one is uh, a questionnaire or questionnaires that can be paper-based or online. Today with this uh, situation, health situation uh, all over the world, we normally use online and there are a lot of uh, online uh, software and applications to collect data. We can also use structure or let's say control observation. This is for the classroom. Typically the classroom in the ELT classroom or ESL, EFL classroom. We can use observation. For example, I can design a, a tally sheet. For example, when uh, I want to observe a specific point in, my, in somebody's school or let's say the university. And I want to know how different strategies, or let's say teaching strategies, uh, teachers use to deal with vocabulary, for example. And I can go to the classroom, observe, and, and just uh, uh, keep in the records of the frequency records of, for example, using Spanish, using figures, using images to explain vocabulary. And then we use the tally sheet, just counting the occurrences um, in, in this. We can also use in structural interviews face to face. Mm -hmm. That looks like a survey, like imagine the, the INEGI, the census. We don't answer, we don't complete the questionnaire, no. The, 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 the interviewer is the one who completes. The questionnaire, the interview is just ask the questions and completes a fairly structured interview form. Uh, interviews can be done by telephone as well. And nowadays with this uh, situation, 
by video conference. And other data collection methods are integrated into experiments. In experiments, normally we, we uh, compare means, averages between one group and, and another, or within the same group before and after certain treatment. We can do that, and that's, that, that counts as quantitative research as well, even though it is a separate uh, ex uh, design. We can also uh, use tests, uh, but let's say more uh, discrete point tests. For example, in applied linguistics, we normally uh, use tests, for example, uh, error correction tests, or if we want to figure out whether learners uh, have already mastered the third singular, the third person singular. So design, we design a test focusing on third person singular, all the plurals, etc. And uh, as I said before, which is similar to structure or control observations, we can use control uh, uh, observations for, uh, let's say, for other aspects which are, let's say, observable in the classroom. So strategies cannot, for example, be totally observed. So we need to find other ways uh, to figure out what's going on in, in our students' brain. That's why we need to resort to other uh, research designs, such as the protocol analysis, think aloud, procedures, etc. But that's, that is part of, uh, uh, can be part of quantitative research if we are going to report uh, frequencies that counts as quantitative research. Now, I'm going to um, move on the examples. I have three studies to, as examples of quantitative research. And this, is done, this, this was conducted by Patricia Ballesteros, a former uh, thesista. Uh, this is an undergraduate uh, uh, thesis or dissertation. Technology mediated vocabulary and strategies in engineering students. That's 2019. As you can see, there are objectives, research questions, or research hypotheses stated. In this case, uh, Ballesteros uh, opted for uh, RQs, research questions. And she measured this through a DLS questionnaire focus on the basis of technology. And there were, in the research questions, we can spot the different variables that she was looking for or she wanted to examine. And for example, if you look at question number two, are there any differences in the use of technology mediated vocabulary and strategies across majors? In this division, there are four majors. So uh, Ballesteros uh, wanted to compare both groups in terms of means, averages, to see if, we, if there were any differences. Also, typically, gender differences are uh, normally uh, emphasized in, 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 in these studies. Uh, once again, uh, a large number of students participated, 268, and she used, Ballesteros used descriptive and inferential statistics. And these are the general results. Mm -hmm. uh, she says that, or she found that uh, more use of discovery vocabulary strategies are, are, were frequently reported more often than memorization and note-taking strategies. She also found differences between uh, or among the majors, the four majors. For example, network energies, energies and energy systems reported using less DLS than environmental and natural resources uh, engineering. And uh, also she observed some gender differences. So this is a, a summary of how we can report how we can um, conduct 
quantitative research using, of course, there should be a correspondence, there should be consistency between uh, all the elements. The point of departure is uh, the objective, the research question or hypothesis, the methods and the results. That's a, a very good example of, and, and this thesis is available at the library if you want to consult it. Study two, it's a very recent, 2020, of course. Uh, uh, this is about, this is an international one, and, and this is about the effect of personal and professional characteristics towards ESL lecturers' digital competence. And this Na Na Naeem and Razak stated two, uh, two, two objectives and one hypothesis. So you can combine. You can have research questions, you can have hypotheses, and, and also they are interrelated. So they must be interrelated. And the method, of course, uh, 233 lecturers participated in this uh, study. And the instrument was uh, another questionnaire a six point uh, Likert scale, which this Likert st scale has two endpoints, end extremes, from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And they have the statement and, and et cetera. And the results, well, this is a key, this is a key uh, component, a key, a key word, I would say. The result reveal no significant difference the, the, the term significant doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean uh, important, relevant. The term significant means that the person, the researchers use inferential statistics. That's why they say uh, we, they didn't find a statistically uh, difference between lecturers' personal characteristics and some significant difference of professional characteristics or digital competence. So in the personal characteristics, there were no differences between among the, the lecturers, but they did find uh, differences in terms of uh, digital competence. Mm -hmm. And this is a good finding, it, it, and, it, and it makes sense. The more digital competence uh, the lecturer may develop, but I would say that the better presentations, better conferences, or I mean, the instrument, or let's say the tools, the digital tools used can help or can enhance uh, uh, presentations. And this is a, a, a good study, also available on the web, open access. And finally, I'm going to uh, talk or describe a little bit about this 2019 study, which is about the effect of use of native accent and non-native accent, like mine, materials on the Iranian EFL learners listening comprehension, and English as an international perspective. And there's a debate about that, of course, but I won't be talking about uh, this debate. Uh, the important bit is that uh, Arabani, Rehani, etc. It stated the objectives here. Well, they stated uh, one research question. Again, is there any difference between primary EFL learners who are taught using native listening materials and those who are instructed using non-native accent? In other words, teacher accent like mine. <laughs> listening materials in terms of their listening comprehension. This is very important to, to, to talk about because a, a certain convention in, in research is the key, the, the, I usually say that the, the keyword effect for the reader as me or the reader in general in the area of in the realm of ELT or research in applied linguistics, the keyword effect normally conveys that the design is or should be experimental because when we, when we measure effect we are talking about an experimental design that's why i wanted to emphasize that 
although in the previous one, this is not an experimental one. Mm -hmm. and, normal, and, and, and these authors are using effect, which is a little bit, a little bit misleading in my, in my own experience effect. So we need to measure certain effect. But in here, there's, they don't, they're not really measuring an effect. They, they are just describing. That's why this study is quantitative and descriptive. So going back to study three, um, as I said, the method is quantitative. Of course, there is a, there is a, a, a hypothesis normally let's say as a convention, in uh, experimental designs, there should be a hypothesis stated. And the hypothesis is here. Uh, there is no significant difference between primary EFL being talked about non-native listening materials and native material, non-native accent uh, in listening comprehension. And that is the, uh, the, research, the research question is related to, to the hypothesis. There should be consistency between the two of them. And the results, well, the experiment, 60 females typically in uh, 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 Muslim schools. This is a, 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 a female school. That's why only female participated. So here gender becomes uh, it's not a variable, gender is considered a constant. Those are the key terms. I'm emphasizing key terms for one reason at the end. And the results, well, there's a design here in the method. There's a quick playment test, and they use uh, uh, two groups, of course, and they compare means, they use descriptive the statistics, and they, they have, or they must use inferential statistics, otherwise you cannot confirm the hypothesis or reject the hypothesis stated previously. Well, the results well indicated that non-native accent listening materials was more effective than using native accent materials, which again makes sense because maybe uh, uh, the, the rhythm, the accent, uh, intelligibility, intelligibility levels, there may be some aspects uh, in there. Well, and finally, I have this very quick exercise for the audience. We have some students here. And this, uh, let us prepare a work cloud on quantitative research. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do, or the audience, please, if you help me, you need to type the first three words you remember from this presentation on quantitative research. Think about keywords we, uh, that we were uh, using in this presentation and go to this website. There are two ways to access. You can go to this website, bit 2 ucro I did it with a, of course, a shortener. Or you can go to menti.com and type the code. Are you ready? Are you with me? Okay. I'm gonna click here. That's bit. Don't do. Ucro. Any here? Just type, please. Three keywords that you remember from this presentation. And all together, we're going to make or design or generate a word cloud. Remember, bit do ucro or go to menti.com and type this code to enter. So there are two ways to do that. I'm going to to do it so that you can see it. Menti.com. Yes, and you, you need to you need to type the 
three, five, and submit. And you have the same, the same site to complete the task. Just three words, no more. Uh huh. And I'm going to check. I'm going to check the results. How this can be created. I want to check it. Let's check it out all together. Aha, uh -huh. look at this, beautiful. Five people have contributed. Seven people have contributed. Thank you. Hypothesis, statistics, research instruments, inferential, research question, sample, experiments. Wow, nice. You see, that's nice to use uh, this kind of Menti Mentimeter, thanks to uh, my wife, Professor Isabel. She suggested this exercise. Thank you, Isabel. Mm -hmm. 14 people, 15 people, product, yep. Experiments, numerical, inferential, data collection. All these words are from you. So you are contributing to this word cloud. And this will be a word cloud to remember, like the film. Like a word to remember, a word cloud to remember. Dr. Dion, do we have time to wait or I can finish? Well, actually, um, yeah. Dr. Manny, what I was wondering is if maybe we could like could continue completing this maybe and we could revisit it just at the end before we close to see what it okay, looks like. Okay, let me close the then. Thank you very much. Let me close this. Uh-huh. And this is my email address. And thank you very much for your kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be part of this seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marina. It's been wonderful. I know it's been very helpful for our students. We've been talking about how, for example, the starting point for all research is identifying a problem in the context we're in, defining an objective, and then working through the methodology, the design, and so forth. So thank you so much. These examples are really, really, I know that they're not only gonna get our students like sparked in terms of like topics maybe, or research questions that they could be thinking about, but it also makes it, I think, achievable, something possible. It's not like something impossible to do. So thank you so much. And we're going to go ahead and move into, we're going to go into um, Dr. Narvaez. Um, if he can start sharing, please, um, his, um, his presentation that he's prepared with us today. Um, Dr. Narvaez, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfredo, for that um, reminding of quantitative research. I have no presentation whatsoever, so I'm just, you're, I'm gonna share my, my video and my voice. Is that clear enough? Of course, that's more than enough. Thank you so much, Dr. Narvaez. Okay, well, um, I'm addressing mainly uh, all the students who are here today. I also have to uh, thank uh, Dion for the invitation to participate in this seminar. Um, we are not currently working at the University of Veracruz. We are about to start next week. And, and I've been teaching a research course for really beginners and a, a, a course on qualitative research for students who are about to finish the degree. Um, uh, well, uh, qualitative research emerges as um, way of trying to understand what people what people makes of experience okay um, if, if you remember uh, Alfredo's presentation they talk about numbers and they try, they talk about hypotheses and they try to they try to predict what's going to happen then uh, researchers elaborate questionnaires or interview guy or whatever and then distributed them into, into the population they are interested in obtaining information from. So in a way, they are milking information from, from participants or subjects as, as they call them. In qualitative research, qualitative research is designed to understand processes. 
Okay, so what happens? And um, uh, qualitative research is designed to describe poorly understood phenomena. I'm, I'm sure you have all been part of a of a study in which they send you a questionnaire or they call you and they ask you some questions and you are restricted to say whether you agree or disagree whether you uh, you whether you are uh, you say yes or no or how frequently you do certain things and i'm also sure that you have sometimes wondered like well that's not always the case i sometimes do this but sometimes do other things so i i cannot fit into the options that the researcher is providing have you ever felt that way you can raise your hand if you if you, you have felt that way or a researcher comes and asks you a question uh, but you say well yeah sometimes but not always it depends okay or maybe you answer the question you answer the the, the questionnaire and then after a while, you kept thinking about it and say, oh, why did I answer that when in reality, I usually do the other? Okay, well, in that case, that's what the qualitative researcher is aiming to obtain, the, the experience that you have, that people have in certain circumstances, in certain phenomena, okay? So qualitative research is also designed to understand differences between stated and implemented policies or theories. Okay, so here comes this policy that says that everybody should stay at home and keep social distancing. All right, but what happened? What happened to poor Dr. Gatel? He tried to predict certain behavior from people. And what has been the result? Okay, that's why qualitative research, uh, from, from my point of view, is closer to what people really think, to what people really experience, to what people really um, go about life. Okay, I mean, uh, it is very difficult to predict how people are going to react under certain conditions, under certain circumstances. And, and I, I'm afraid and nobody wanted so many deaths from, from the COVID, but we didn't listen, we didn't pay attention, or well, we listened to them, to the suggestions, to the recommendations, but we are very difficult to deal with. People don't usually follow the protocols. Um, and that ha has happened with educational phenomenon. People have tried to explain why some students achieve better results than others in term, but in terms of quantitative research in which students are asked to, to fill as to answer a survey. Uh, it would be more beneficial to the educational field if we go with those students who keep struggling and ask them directly what's going on, what's happening, tell me your experience, what makes you uh, obtain lower grades than your classmates or and also go to, with the higher high achievers and ask them hey what do you do which is is a very open question and we don't know the answer to those questions therefore the value of qualitative research tell me you who are going through this process how you interpret that process and i will as a researcher try to portray your point of view your experience in a paper in a in the um, findings section so um, qualitative research is also designed to discover unspecified contextual variables if you remember alfredo talked about um, variables and whether men or women are different or, or answer differently or there are differences in whether they how they acquire vocabulary or but we don't know um, um, but when we go to the people when you actually ask open-ended questions you come to realize that there are many other let's call them variables that interfere 
with the process that the, those people are experimenting in life in, in or in at school. So that's why I, I resume. I, I resume. Uh, collective research is designed to understand processes, describe poorly understood phenomena, understand differences between stated and implemented policies or theories, and discover unspecified contextual variable variables. Um, so, what are the main characteristics of qualitative research? It's, um, it's when the researcher is interested in understanding the meaning people have constructed. What does it mean for the students? What does it mean for teachers? What does it mean for the policymakers? What does X mean to this population, to this sample, to these people you are interested in researching? You, as, a, as the researcher, are the primary instrument of data collection and analysis. You go with the people, you interview, you talk to them, you observe them in their, uh, in their context, and you make sense of what they tell you or what you observe. You are the, uh, the main instrument of data collection. And then, when you start observing uh, your people, when you start talking to people, you start making sense of the, what, what they are telling you, so you are already analyzing. You don't have to wait until everybody has answered the survey or you have observed all the people you want to observe. You, you start the analysis right there, right after the first interview, right after the first observation, and that helps you focus or narrow your further observations or your further questions. Um, Research usually involves field, field work. You have to go there to the classroom, to the schools, to where to the places where teachers hang out, to the places where the students meet. So it involves there. So you are not distant from them. You are you are uh, you, you you have to become a member of that community in order for them to open up to you and then tell you and um, participate in your study. So it is more human, more personal, is warmer than uh, quantitative research. Uh, what comes after your interviewing, your observations, your data analysis um, is richly descriptive. You have to describe the context, you have to describe the people, you have to describe um, how it happened. You have to, there, there's a, a procedures um, section in which you have to tell us how you went about collecting the information, collecting the data. And uh, um, different from quantitative research, the sample in your study is purposive or purposeful. I mean, you don't need large numbers of people. As long as you obtain uh, a rich description of the phenomenon, you are, um, you are um, investigating, you don't need large numbers of people. It may be one or two or three people in your study, as long as you go deep into their understanding of the phenomena you are studying. So, um, um, for example, you, you may, you may um, write your research purpose in the following terms, like, the purpose of this study is to understand the experience of being an underpaid teacher, right? Or the purpose of this study is to comprehend the experience of a member of the gay community. So in order to answer, to, to pursue these research purposes, you may, you may start interviewing your teachers who we are usually underpaid, except those tiempos completos. But most teachers are underpaid, so anyone can be your 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 participant. Uh, and then you may start with one teacher and say, "Okay, I got this teacher's perspective, but she or he told me certain things. Now I'm going to go with another teacher and tell me and to see whether he agrees or disagrees with what teacher one told me." And you may go on and on until 
So people usually ask, how many people should participate in a qualitative study? And the answer is, there are no numbers. But uh, when they talk about data saturation, when people stop telling you new things, okay? So if you interview one people and you identify um, five things that the teacher mentioned, and then the second teacher mentions those five plus another one, but the third teacher repeats the first five, and then the, so you say there's no point in continuing interviewing teachers because I have already saturated the data. They're, they're, they are not telling me anything new. Then you stop interviewing or observing or collecting your your data. Um, but you have to to think carefully about who are going to be your participants. For example, in the example of the underpaid teachers, you have to decide whether men and women would be included, age range, years of experience, teaching level. So you determine your sample beforehand. So you say, well, from the underpaid teachers, the, the what's the word? Uh, the population of underpaid teachers, you have to say, well, I'm going to only interview those who are uh, new to teaching or those who have been teaching for, for more than 25 years, then you uh, identify those teachers and you go and, and, talk, and talk to them, interview them, okay? Um, what else? Which are the main sources of data for qualitative research? Um, interviews, uh, focus group, but th those interviews have to be open, open-ended questions, not like, do you think that uh, this is good because they are going to answer yes or no. So you need to, to, to phrase your questions very carefully so that they, they have a chance to tell you their, under, their, their interpretation, their views on, on the topic you are um, researching. Open-ended questions. What do you think of? How about this? Tell me your experience during that. You may also use focus groups. So invite three, four um, people to a cafe, and then you, you, you drop a question, you, you ask a question, then let them discuss among themselves, and you lead the conversation. Whenever they stop talking, you ask another question, et cetera. Uh, you can observe, but uh, differently from the quantitative in which you, you come with a, an observation sheet and you tally a previously arranged, previously identified phenomena, you go there with an M, with a blank sheet and you start noting whatever you are interested in and how people are behaving. So you start with an, a blank piece of paper and you start making annotations. After a while, you may convert that into an observation sheet, but it would be different because it comes from the participants, from the people you are observing, not from a predisposed, a pre-thought of um, uh, questionnaire or observation sheet. You can collect docu documented materials such as letters, diaries, photographs. Um, you can you can use questionnaires as long as they are open-ended questions. Okay. And this is a problem that uh, that I have had with my students here. They they use questionnaires, but most of the questions are yes, no, or, or so, and that doesn't help. That doesn't provide information that you need. Or they say yes, no, why? That's very typical. Do you think I'm a, I am a good teacher? Yes, no, why? So why don't you rephrase the question to? Uh, what do you think of me as a teacher? And then you let them express, you suck, you're brilliant, you're fantastic. So you get a, a wider collection of answers rather than yes or no. Okay, Dion, are we okay with the time? Yeah, I think we probably need to start wrapping up to make sure we have enough time to squeeze um, Dr. Cody in here. So we're, we have about 10 minutes left um, for her to present. Afterwards, we can go a few minutes over, already confirmed with her, but if we can start wrapping up. Thank okay. you. 
So I hope that this uh, talk has been helpful to you. And let me let me just mention some of the the research that we have done using qualitative oh i can't find it now contrast technology but um well I, I provided two examples the purpose of this study is to understand or the purpose of this study is to comprehend and no can't find it sorry don't worry about it, Oscar. You can always, if you want to, um, share it with us afterwards. If you have like a recommend, we I know that we have already um, the access to a book that you co-authored with Dr. Marina as well. So um, we're definitely going to be using that as well. Oh yes, please. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, then, Dr. Narvaez, for your help for sharing all your experience with us and. And kind of detailing a little bit more about how qualitative research um, differs is similar to you know some of the commonalities between research methods and so forth it's really helpful for our students so i'm not going to take very much time to transition into um, dr cody's presentation and i'm actually going to share my screen here that she had sent me um, so i think we should be seeing it are you there yes maria Yes. yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. okay. Go ahead. Here, Thank you, you so hear? much. Okay, I'll take I'll take it over from here. But first, let me say thank you to uh, to Dion for inviting me to be here. It's really special to share some of the work that we've done together. Um, and um, I've had a little bit of internet. There's a delay in my speaking for presenting two very important types of research that um, is, is often frequent in the work that we do as educational scholars. So uh, my part is to talk about, I get the easy part, is to talk about mixed methods research and what that means. And I would like to share with you two examples of the way that mixed methods research um, is used in the context of education and teacher, in particular teacher education and the work of teachers. So, um, so, that, so that's the first slide. And Dion, um, if you could go to the second, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and so you might scroll through there so we can see. Mixed methods research has two different components, but the most important thing I'd like for you to take away from this presentation is to remember that mixed methods research is a combination of techniques that we use as scholars, as academics, to answer a research question. So sometimes people say they're a quantitative research methodologist or a qualitative research methodologist, but in fact, um, a methodologist, methods are just the tools that we use to answer a question. And sometimes those tools involve numbers and they're very important for us to understand trends and what's happening at a large scale. Um, sometimes those methods are very deep. I liked what Dr. Oscar said, becoming a member of that community. He used the word deep and he used the word context. And so those are tools, qualitative research methods are tools that we use to answer those questions, but to gain a different sense of what's happening of a phenomenon and so mixed methods research we have the best of both worlds we can do what makes the most sense for us to um, understand a phenomenon um, so here i put on this first slide that qualitative methods some examples that you may already be using are things like conducting an interview um, one of my students recently described a kind of interview with teachers in schools as tiny talks. Um, and he used this idea of tiny talks. Those are kind of talks that take place when you know you're going into a school and looking over your shoulder and talking to a teacher. 
and they tell you, he tells you or she tells you something really important and you go back and you take notes on that. Um, it's less formal than an individual interview that's audio recorded, but also a very important kind of data collection, a tool that helps us understand something. So, so we have individual interviews. We often write reflection notes when we observe. I, I do a lot of reflection notes because I don't want, uh, in a school, for example, I don't want people to feel uncomfortable that I'm audio recording them. So I will take a lot of notes and I actually quote a lot of what people say and write that down. So we have reflection notes, observations, and other kinds of notes about observations. And we can do that using language, using details um, and lots of context, as Dr. Oscar was mentioning, and going deep. What does that teacher's face look like when I ask her where she is from? That, that knowing where she, what she, the response is as important to me as her answer. So those are deep reflection and observation notes. Um, quantitative research methods, as, as Dr. Alfredo mentioned, are things like understanding observations, but scoring them. So we, I'll give you an example in just a minute of how we score teachers. Um, a key of quantitative research methods that we use, we often look at student achievement scores. That's a number and it helps us to understand something. And we look at those scores over time. So those are other kinds of methods to help us understand a phenomenon. But again, we have the best of both worlds in this, in this case. Um, we use, or I use qualitative and quantitative research methods to answer the question. So that's the, the next uh, slide, please. Thank you, Dion. Okay, so um, I wanna give you just two examples. Um, so four years. I'm just going into the fifth year. So that's a long time. Uh, Dion was part of this study for several years. Um, and this is called, the study is called Project Stellar. And STELLAR stands for Supporting Teachers of English Language Learners Across Rural Settings. This is one of the very few research studies um, that works with multilingual students and their teachers and educators in rural communities. And we, we know that rural communities don't function like cities. And um, we believe that something special happens in rural communities. And because people think maybe there's a misconception that rural is somehow less advanced or backwards or lots of pejorative negative terms. Um, so we've been looking at the way we prepare teachers um, and help them understand multilingual students in rural communities. It's been very, very interesting. So the research question of this study is how does a place-based, a rural and professional development program for English language learners in a professional development project, what happens at the end? Do students really learn more? Do they learn better? Do they improve in their language? Do they improve in mathematics? So this is a, a study, as you can see, an, a, a complicated research question with lots of possibilities around it. So I was looking at this thinking, okay, what are, what are some of the ways I can answer this question? What are some of the things I want to know about about this, about how to answer about this study. So some of it are, for example, rich and detailed descriptions of the professional development. I would wanna know what was the prof professional development program? Where did it take place? How did teachers and leaders participate? What do they think about it? If I wanna know what they think about it, if they liked it, if they didn't like it, what they liked about it, I need to ask them. So I could use quantitative methods. I could do a survey and have done a survey of them, but it doesn't give me the depth of what I want to know. I want to know what components really felt important to them and changed their lives and changed their instruction. So I'll ask them I want to learn. 
I'll also want them to describe place. Remember, this is about rurality. And um, I want them to know what they say about working in a rural community. What do they think about it? Who's there? Why, what are the strengths of that community? So I want to know uh, details. Um, I'll also, in this study, and I have been conducting, now this is interesting, you can see an observation tool that we use to understand uh, what teachers do in their classrooms after they uh, participate in our program. And so we are actually scoring teachers sometimes and taking observation notes of what they do. And, and then we'll ask them why. Why did you group three students thinking about that? So you, this is a really good example of how quantitative and qualitative methods can come together to help us answer the question. And then finally, I listed up there that we're also looking at student achievement scores. And boy, that's a messy, uh, a messy uh, task, right? Just getting student achievement scores is a lot of work. Um, we are looking at things like how well students do in math, how well they do in English, how well they do in state standards. See, because sometimes we're missing scores for one student or one student is part of our program and then the next year leaves but comes back in year three. So it's, um, it's not just as easy as pulling the scores together, but we're also running analyses to understand the relationship between teachers who were in our program and how those students do and teachers who were not in our program and how their students do. So this is a design called a quasi-experimental study. I won't go into too much detail of that, but no, my point is that you can see how one is to find the best methods I can use to answer. Put in there, I can look for other things too. And we have lots of data on uh, um, how the participants, uh, what they said when they were in classes and they're just, so the next one, please. Okay, so here I thought, um, here I thought that maybe you could think about, and maybe you could respond in the chat box if you are able to, um, and as a, as a project that might be uh, related to the work that you do. So some of the projects that I work on are teacher inquiry projects. Inquiry is also known in our field sometimes as action research or guided inquiry. And these are uh, questions or wonderings that teachers have about their instruction with ultimately the goal of improving student learning. So we're very interested in teachers trying different methods themselves in order to help students learn. Um, and I also, I also want to add there, we're also very concerned in student communities where uh, there may be limited access to food, transportation. These are challenges that rural teachers face. And so when they talk about student learning there uh, and student well-being, they're often talking about making sure that students have what they need to be safe and healthy. Um, so an example of a teacher um, inquiry might be at the classroom level. A teacher might ask, for example, how will the use of my student's first language in small groups before reading a text affect their reading comprehension? Now, this teacher might measure reading comprehension or, 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 or might use other things to reading comprehension. But if you'd like to, um, and you, you could put in the chat, I think everybody has access to the chat, right? Um, what are some of the methods, qualitative and quantitative, that you think this teacher could use to answer her question? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. Okay, it might just delay a little. Um, so what are the questions, what are some of the things a teacher might use, qualitative and quantitative, to answer the question above? How uh, will students' first language in small groups prior to reading a text affect That's an idea? I can, I can talk through a little bit. Um, as a teacher, you know, I'd be thinking, okay, 
Um, first, I'd want to know what are my students' first languages. I kind of got to know what my students' first languages are. And sometimes students feel uh, students have more than one first language, and they may feel more comfortable. Um, comfortable. In, in in uh, one language or another. So the first thing I'd want to do is, yes, uncomfortable what my students' first languages are and make notes, right? Jose Roberto said interviews, right? And right, so an interview might be asking students, how, you know, how, how do you feel, which language would you like to use or which language do you feel you could use before reading a text? Interview would be perfectly good. Um, it may be an informal interview with students, okay? Um, I might also ask students in an interview what kind of text they like to read. So I might go ahead and say, okay, all of these um, students like to read about related to um, science fiction. So uh, maybe I have a third grade classroom or a fourth grade classroom and I have a text in science fiction. I might group these students by their first language and also by the kind of text that they like. And, um, and remember, I'm trying to help them build reading comprehension, okay? So I might do that. And then what I also might do here is take some observation notes. I might be watching students, putting them in small groups, grouping them by what they like to read, and then watching them. I'll give them some guiding questions and say, okay, well, uh, Jose, he likes, uh, he seems to participate and speak a lot, but Maria, she, um, she's more quiet. I might be taking notes. Now, as I'm doing that, I'm also thinking about how this affects their reading comprehension. So um, how might I go ahead and understand reading comprehension? What methods might I, what methods could I use? Anybody like to put, is improving. Perhaps another uh, informal interview to know how students feel after doing this activity. Okay, that might be great. I could do an informal interview. If I do that, I'll have used um, different methods that are mostly qualitative, right? But I could also um, use a checklist with a score rubric to see if students understood, for example, who was the protagonist in the story. And maybe if they understand and can explain that, I might score them a two. Um, I might use something even more formal to understand reading comprehension. I might give them a test that is um, standardized, or I might give them a test that I created um, that's less standardized. The other thing, remember, I could also ask students to self-evaluate. I could do how much they felt they learned text together in their first language. So I could use scores in different ways, um, and they're not just limited to standardized tests. So thanks, William, for that. Very good. Um, so those are some of the things I could do in my own classroom, okay? So what I've given you here are two examples. Um, one big study where we're using mixed methods, but also a more close study right to the classroom sec setting where a teacher herself or himself can use mixed research methods. So hopefully that makes sense. I think we have another slide next, Dion. Can you go to the, thank you. There's the next slide. Okay, thank you. Sorry for my, my internet here. Um, so um, just here is a final slide to wrap up. So you see um, it's important to make, make connections across different research methods um, when doing any kind of research, but in certainly in mixed methods research. And you see I put in the middle the research question. So um, what I'd like to underscore again is that the methods that you choose to use really should come from 
your question and the best ways that you can answer the question, okay? So I put four suggestions that should guide, the research questions should guide any methods that you choose to use. It could be qualitative, quantitative, and you'll get different findings. Um, mixed methods allows us to see across lots of data with scores or surveys, and also go deep what individual people or groups of people should be answerable. So when you're doing research on a small, you can do. If a research question is too complicated and you don't see how you're gonna get through it, I think you have to go back and narrow in on one small part of what you wanna know. So it should be answerable. And sometimes it's too expensive to do research or it's too time consuming. It has to be very realistic um, based on what, you, what resources you have. Um, the research question might and should lead you to new questions, especially for classroom teachers. Um, you might be going into a classroom yourself. If you didn't get the answer to your question on small grouping and first language, you might ask another question like, what if I were to group the boys together and the girls together? Maybe that would help improve their reading comprehension. So you could ask different questions based on what you learned. It becomes more of a cycle of research. And finally, to student learning. A research question should help build student learning and, and also uh, underscoring that, especially in rural communities, so to have improved quality of life and access to food, healthcare, and the things they need to lead fulfilling lives.